Okay, I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll start going Thank again. You. Okay, wonderful. Welcome to episode number 132 of the Life Changing Questions podcast. Today, I'm getting to interview a true Australian icon. Now, I've lived in Australia for over 14 years. And in that time, I had one question in the back of my mind, which is, who is Jim? Everywhere I seem to drive around the roads, there are trailers with uh, Jim's face, advertising Jim's mowing, uh, Jim's cleaning, Jim's pet grooming. And uh, that question kind of comes to the front recently. Uh, in my social media feed, I saw a gentleman standing up in an audience. And he said that he, something like he worked for Qantas for 30 years. And during that time, he never once met any of the CEOs. And now he's at this company. He loves the fact that he's got close connection with his CEO. He has his email address. He has his phone number. And he really loves working in this organization. And it turned out that the owner of this organization was, was Jim. And so as I looked further into Jim, uh, I, was, I became more and more fascinated. It turns out that in 1982, uh, with $24 uh, in his pocket, he started just cutting grass for people to help him see his way through his PhD at La Trobe University. Now, somehow, several uh, decades later, he has something in the region of 4,600 franchisees. He deals with 175,000 customers per week and does close to half a billion in revenue per annum. So uh, if you're not excited to listen to this episode, then you're in completely in the wrong place because I am. Jim, welcome to uh, the show today. Yeah, good to be here. Jim, it, uh, it kind of blows my mind that I was able to see that video and reach out to you. And then you personally responded to me within such a short period of time. How is it possible that the CEO of an organization uh, is so able to, to be on top of a business in that way and uh, have personal interaction with uh, you know, potential customers, etc.? Well, one of my great uh, advantages, Kevin, is I'm not very good at doing a lot of things. So I tend to have great staff, great managers to do them instead. And I focus on certain key jobs, obviously talking to um, people about the business, but also talking to my franchisees. I, I find it's very useful to be in contact with the grassroots of the business because if anything goes wrong, I can look at it and say, okay, why is this happening? What, how can we do it better? I love that. And I really got the sense of that in your book. Now, I know there's there's a couple of books. There's, of course, the one you've written yourself, which is, uh, you know, Every Customer a Fan. And, of course, there's the, uh, the the approved biography as well, which is Jim's book. But I got that sense of you, but that every customer is a fan. Tell us about how that's really been at the heart of your business and why that's been so important for you to, to religiously focus on that. Well, when I started off in business, and that was just mowing lawns at university and stuff, I didn't know anything about business, and I never intended to be a career. I wanted to be an academic. Um, <coughs> and I've made a lot of very, very stupid mistakes over the years. I tend to be very rash. I tend to jump into things I don't know about. I tend to appoint the wrong people. But I've, what I've always had is a deep emotional attachment to service. I, I was always fanatical about making my clients happy, about doing the best possible job, about turning up when I said I was. And then when I became a started the franchise, I, I applied the same lesson even more strongly to my franchisees. That what can I do to make them more successful? And and the whole thing was surprising. Somebody asked me at the beginning when I first franchised how many I might have one day, and I said maybe if it goes well, you know, could, we could have a hundred. Well, we've just actually hit 6,700. Wow. Because <laughs> we've grown okay. so fast. But, and what's <laughs> even more interesting about it is this, that the actual unserviced leads are 38% so far this year. So, so there's wow. um, we are finding it very, very difficult to cope with the, the volume of, of demand for our services. It's going, going up even higher than the number of franchisees. Well, that's incredible. Now, I think I got my data from your book, which was written maybe a year, year and a half ago, I think. So to jump from the, uh, you know, the 4,600 to the 6,700 in that time, you guys are clearing on some good momentum right now. Yeah, we've had a great couple of years. It's going very, very well. We hope to hit 5,000 later on this year, but it's never the, it's never the, the number one thing. The most important statistic I could quote to you is from our last survey showing that, um, only 7% of our franchises report poor income, which is the lowest ever. It's 52% was good, the rest was satisfactory. So that, that figure alone is what is the one that actually counts the most, more than numbers and more than profitability. Though, of course, if you do look after people and they do very well, they make good money, well, then, you know, obviously you do, you do tend to grow. But the service yeah. comes first. Exactly. So, so service first. And I get that's really been at the heart. I, that really comes through so strongly uh, in, in your book and in the story that you share there. Uh, Jim, I, I know uh, I mentioned that you, you began, though, with a PhD and your background was more uh, so in history and in science. So 
how, how do you go from uh, doing a PhD in those kind of fields to then ended up being the, the head of such a, a large and growing company? Uh, well, <laughs> because I really, I, I was a failure as an academic. I developed a theory of society and history, which to me had huge implications, but it wasn't really history anymore. It was history and cross-cultural anthropology and psychology and zoology and a whole lot of things. And I wanted to pursue it, but there was no possible way anybody would give me a job because there's no, there's no job description. You have to be, for a historian, you have to be the, the world expert in say the Wars of the Roses or something like that. And, and I was not even expert in history as such. I was uh, interested in everything. So I realized what I needed to do was to found a research institute to follow up all the physiology and all the, the genetic implications of my theory. And to do that, I needed money. So I just turned to the only thing I knew how to do, which is my lawns. <laughs> That's how it began. Okay, I, I love that. And of course, uh, many decades later, then you are able to fund some of the research you wanted to do uh, into this field? Yes, I'm currently spending something over $2 million a year, and it'll shortly be raised. We're looking for a CRISPR expert at present, somebody who understands the way that the that, um, system to actually change individual genes to turn them on or off, which is the key to civilization and a lot of other things, I believe. Yeah, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit more about that. It's a little bit off a uh, piece of business, but I think there may be some valuable lessons or metaphors in here, because one of the things you you were really looking at then was about how uh, cultures and societies grow and then, uh, you know, I guess, uh, break apart again as well. So is there some something interesting from that you could share with us from your experience? Well, I, I went to university with the idea of understanding the rise and fall of civilizations and to see it had implications for our own society and came up with what I believe is the reason that it's something to do with civilization is actually a kind of character. It's based on the character of individual people and it depends on a sort of character that was evolved among animals as a reaction to limited food. Now, in humans, it doesn't quite work that way. But it's driven by other things like, like chastity and so forth. But that's basically the idea. So what happens is you get an environmental influence, whether it's through religion, through food or whatever, that changes character in such a way that makes people more um, suited to living in large states, more hardworking, more enterprising, more creative. So what you've really got to do, what we're trying to do in our study is to figure out what are the epigenetic changes that are taking place? What are the biochemical changes? What changes in proteins and cytokines? In, even in microbes, and then reverse engineer the whole thing so that you can actually make changes. So, for example, if a person's a, a drug addict, theoretically speaking, if you understood what to do, you could actually give them an injection or a navel spray or whatever, and they just wouldn't want to have drugs anymore because they'd think much more long term. So that, that's, that's kind of the implications of it. It's quite major. If it, if it, if it ever works out, it'll be a trillion dollar industry, but <laughs> it's not basically. And, and, no and the rest. <laughs> and the rest, uh, it certainly yeah. would. Um, well, there's there's a lot a lot of power in that. Hey, I, I really know very little about this field. I think I read one book which may even come close, which is a biology of belief, belief by Bruce Lipton, and that was really interesting to me because uh, he was saying on some level that you know our beliefs and the way that we think of things can actually change our um, our cells and even at a level. Is there something related in that with your study? I'm actually a fan of the idea of character. I think character is behind everything. People overestimate things like uh, intelligence. Now, the best, in, the best in estimates are that intelligence only accounts for probably about 4% of success in life. Overwhelmingly, it's character, it's determination, it's hard work, it's enterprise, it's creativity, it's ambition, it's ethics, integrity, all those kind of things matter enormously more than ability as such. And that's something that's been very much confirmed from my own as, as a franchisor because we deal with thousands of people and we look at who succeeds and who fails and why and, and again and again it issues of character great franchisees and great franchisors are people who look at what they do and say how can I do it better poor ones are the ones that say the system is bad I'm not doing it. I'm doing nothing wrong all these complaints and everything else that's being said that's all the fault of the system it's fault of my clients it's a fault of Jim I don't need to change anything and they're the ones that fail so character okay. is everything and and in that sense my research program and the what we do in gyms is very much aligned okay i love that character is everything and i think 
in, in the middle of that, then there's something about being in control and actually choosing what you can control. It's easy for me to blame things external to me, but actually much harder to look at me and change the things about me that would make the system or the process uh, process work. Uh, Jim, if we wanted to develop our character, what, what are some of the key things that, you know, from your experience that we should be doing? Exercise, number one. I mean, I'm 70 and I'm in amazing shape. I, I run a half an hour every morning. I, I'm super fit. I, I actually even, apart from that, I, I would average 6,000 steps a day. I'm very active physically. I'm a good weight. That's also building character. So you've got to, what you've got to do is to discipline yourself to do the kind of things that build character. Um, always looking for the long-term benefits rather than the short-term in other words, you know, do you want to have, you know, fatty, greasy foods or would you rather eat something healthy? Well, in the short term, you'd be better off enjoying the fatty food. But in the long term, you're going to be less successful and less happy if you go that way. Exercise is the same thing. So there's a wonderful book called Atomic Habits. I don't know if you've read it. If you haven't, you should, which talks about how you can develop habits how you make small changes, you make things easy yourself. You, you create an image of yourself. I am the kind of person that exercises regularly. I'm the kind of person that does this. And it gives you strategies on how to go about that. I would recommend starting from character. There was a study done in a West African country where they actually gave a group of, there was three groups of businesses, micro businesses. One of them they gave no help at all to. The other they gave like business advice, business training, business plans, that kind of thing. And the third one, they gave training in character on discipline, on how to cope with disappointments and stuff. Now, the interesting thing is the business training had absolutely zero effect on their success. They were no more successful than the ones that had no training at all. But the ones that were trained in character did astonishingly better on every measurement. And we get it wrong. I think people stress too much education I'd say if you want to be successful in business, going to business school is a very bad idea or university, unless you want to go work for a big company, in which case you need to. I'd say if you want to be successful in business, go and work for McDonald's or, or somewhere like that, or work for gyms or somewhere where you, you can learn habits and character and discipline. McDonald's is a great company, great, great training, great franchisors, terrible food. I want to let my kids eat it, but I really admire them. Well, and as a business system, you're right. Uh, they, they've had a lot of success globally. So you can't, you can't fault that. And knowing that you can get someone uh, who's probably fresh out of school without any education and they can help run that whole system, that model, it's, uh, it is, it's quite an example. Uh, and so right. one start, of my most successful start... people actually came from that background. He dropped out of school as young as he possibly could, went to work for McDonald's, learned his skill. He turned over, but in his second year, like $800,000. And he's now doing other things like running regions, running most of Queensland for mowing. He's just an amazing guy. Not much education, but great character building. I love that. Start with character, such an important message. And you said about the habits. And so one is building that discipline. And the, the, the book Atomic Habits, I have read it. And I think it's by James Clear, if I remember right. I'll, if anyone yes. listening, I'll put that in the show notes. You should, should definitely have a read of that one. Um, so exercise is really important. And the fact that you're out running and moving every single day uh, is, is fascinating. You're, you're doing more than I am, you know, and <laughs> you're a good example to me because um, you, you uh, Age, is, age, age creeps up uh, on all of us. We're all going to get older, so we better take care of our body and our health. Outside of uh, exercise and building those um, those character habits, is there anything else that you think is really important as business owners or business leaders that we should be focused on in terms of our habits? It's it's a, look. It doesn't. Matter. It's everything that you do. Like I have a thirteen year old son, and this is a this is a great kid. But one of the things he does, and with a bit of parental encouragement, every morning he gets up, he makes his bed, he tidies his room. This is a 13 year old boy, okay? He also does, we do a fast in, in our, as part of our church um, where we, you give up certain things for an entire month. Well, of his own bat, he just, he, he implements that. He starts with that kind of thing and then we both agree together what we're going to give up jointly. Like he's gonna only have uh, junk food. The last one was two days a week and um, it was uh, very it was strict limits on computer games. Now he just started that he's building that character himself. Into the age, and he started doing his fast like eight years old. He's developing habits of character and discipline. And these are these small things are what you call keystone habits because self-discipline is it's like a muscle in your mind. And if you use it and use it, use it on the small things, the big things will take care of themselves. See, people often 
say, you know, what, where did you, you know, you were just mowing lawns and doing nothing and suddenly you had this idea, what about franchising? And then you're a multi-millionaire. It is so totally, totally <laughs> unlike that. What happens is that every day, every day of my life, I'm saying to myself the question, how can I do it better? Now, that applies to everything. How can I em empty the dishwasher? How can I more effectively, more quickly? How can I do a better job of wiping down the benches? How can I put out the laundry? How can I make my bed in a way that's it's just small, tiny things? And you're always focusing on improving everything that you do. The, the little tiny changes are the ones that build character and build destiny. I love that. There's so, so much power in there. And uh, there's something that we can do every single day. And of course, you alluded to the point there that it's not like you were cutting lawns and then you set up a franchise system and then boom, you have this amazing success here. It's not been a straight line. Jim, reading in your books, uh, clearly there's been a lot of, uh, lot of ups and a, and a lot of downs along the way. And potentially... Uh, even at some points along the journey, the whole thing could have could have fallen over in a heap uh, with certain times, droughts, problems, etc. So, uh, how how have you managed to keep going through all that time? I had no choice, Kevin, because my research has always been my goal. I don't live rich. My kids, at some theoretical knowledge, know that we're wealthy, but we don't live like that. I drive a ten thousand dollar Mitsubishi, and and I dress from you know basically Kmart stuff like that. So <clears throat> I don't like spending money. You go out for dinner with my family, which I do. You know, it's a local Indian restaurant or, or a pizza joint, something like that. We we don't live wealthy, but I have this drive for success because I have to make my research because it will change the world if I'm correct, and if I can show it's correct, we can do immense things. So in a sense giving up was never a possibility it was never a question but the, the actual mistake the things that went wrong were not actually mostly things like droughts and stuff we did fine in the droughts it was it was the it was the my own personal failings like like being too impulsive rushing into things without counting up the costs first um you know making stupid decisions about people and not trusting the wrong person and not checking on them i mean look even in the last couple of years we've made terrible mistakes if I could go back two years now and actually avoid some of the mistakes we've made, particularly in the IT area, where we just had the wrong people in charge. We, we hopefully we think we've got the right person now, but it's going to be 18 months. Well, we should have started that two years ago. We'd already be where we should be now. We'd be so far ahead. So it's, it's personal weaknesses that make the difference. And it's personal strengths that make the difference, too. I'm, I'm that's quite that's astonished that I've been successful as I have. I honestly do. I sometimes look at it and I say, how on earth can an idiot like me ever achieve anything? <laughs> I think that quite often. You are, you are very modest. I, I certainly don't think you're an idiot by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and it's great that you look back. You said, hey, if you look back two years, you would do something differently. If you were to go back uh, to the very beginning, you know, if you were to think about that, would you, would you do anything different from the start? Oh, right. Everything. Look, uh, I tell you something. First of all, I've never, if I, I often think about rewinding the time clock, I would never, ever, ever go back more than 13 years because if you do that, you don't have the same children. That, that alone is good enough not to want to go back. But yeah. leaving that aside, if I can go back to the beginning when I first started thinking about franchising, oh my goodness, I had no idea what I was doing, Kevin. I didn't have a clue. I didn't understand about the value of meetings, for example. I thought business was all about providing people with leads and advice. I didn't understand the importance of community. You know, I thought we should do things like business reviews. I didn't understand that was useless. What we need to do is to talk to our franchises regularly on a personal level and then, and then get together with them. Relationships, community matter so, so much. The fee systems we used at the beginning were, were terrible. I actually... <laughs> I didn't invest in technology early enough. I didn't, I didn't understand how powerful and how crucial that would be. Our ability to do things like when a job comes in, we might have 20 franchisees covering the area. We need to know which one can handle it. It's often only one person because most of our people are very busy. So you've got to know that. And not only that, but what they do this service and you know what time of day they can do it, all kinds of things. That's all computerized now. So it's, and then all the different things I threw money at, like I tried to get a tourist venture going and, and, and I was I was ripped off by, by an internal accountant and oh my goodness. I, I mean, there's so many dumb things that I've done. So yes, if, if it took me back to 1982, I reckon it would take me less than half the time to get back here knowing what I know now. Yeah, wow, that's, uh, that's amazing. 
And of course, yeah, you would dodge all of those uh, those hires, uh, cheating accountants. <laughs> you would certainly sidestep those. That makes a heap of sense. And the, and the tech can make a uh, a major major difference. You mentioned something in there about you know about your purpose as well. And I get there's a strong sense of purpose for you to create your research, and you know that's going to be uh, you know when that's proven, what you believe is going to make a major impact on the world. The other element around purpose you mentioned as well, church. And I know at the beginning of your journey, you weren't necessarily religious uh, in the same way that you are now. So how much is having that faith made a difference to your journey too? Um, Jim has an ethos of service, which is very heavily influenced by my Christian beliefs. And, and the way I look at it too, is that we don't see it as a hierarchy with us at the top as franchisors and everybody down there. We see us as serving our franchisees. And the great model for that is Jesus washing his disciples' feet, which was far more radical than we could possibly understand. Because in those days, washing somebody's feet, which were typically very filthy because they, they you know, used to walk around in sandals on dusty roads and things. No, but you mean in those days. So, so only a slave or a very menial person would wash somebody's feet. Occasionally, if there was a really revered rabbi, the disciples would wash their feet as a sign of ultimate respect. Jesus washed his own disciples' feet. That aspect of service, that when you run something, you're actually serving those that you run, is absolutely fun fundamental. And I, and I believe that what I do is, is that God guides me to, to do certain things, that you just don't take shortcuts. You never, ever look at the money first. You look at the principles of service first, which is one reason yeah. why I don't think Jim should ever become a public company, because that, that gets you chasing the stock price. I'm listening to a audio book about um, Jack Welch, the man who broke capitalism. And it's, it's absolutely devastating the kind of stuff that he did. It's horrifying. He was just brutal. He was, he was a nasty man. And it, in the end, it really damaged the business as well as, as blighting tens of thousands of lives. That kind of attitude to business is just wrong. And I don't think it's good business either. Not in the long term. Not in the long term. And I know you face some challenges along the way where actually you've sacrificed the money, uh, you know, in, in the pursuit of doing the right thing. And that's, that doesn't sound like an easy thing to do when you're, you're in a tricky financial situation, but it sounds like that's paid you back. One of the stories that comes out from the book from me, Jim, um, I think uh, you were undercharged when you went to buy some, some mowing equipment by a hundred dollars. And you realized when you went away and you thought of all of the reasons why you, you, uh, you, you, you know, you deserve that. That was great. But then, you know, it, it caught up on you that actually no, it was not the right thing. And you took that back, you gave that money back. And then sure enough, I think you said that very next afternoon or the next day, that money came from another source that you weren't expecting. And, you know, and that's because you did the right thing. And I really love that message. Yeah. Well, that, that's a very Christian way of looking at things. Cause obviously I believe that was a, it was a, to me, it was a sign. It was a, it was a clear sign. I must say it's probably the only time in my business career that I've been really tempted to do what was clearly the wrong thing. Um, most of the time it's very easy it's just like I mean just to give you one example okay we've been going 33 years we've got nearly 5,000 franchisees do you know how many times we've been to court twice twice, twice. wow because we go out of our way to look after people and make sure we treat them as fairly as possible and I must say in both those cases we ended up accepting the case where they accepted what I offered them before the case began they didn't get one extra cent because they there was we offered them we made them a fair offer. Now we if we terminate franchisors, for example, some of those businesses are worth hundreds of thousands, even millions of dollars. We allow them to sell their business. We terminate them for reasons and said, okay, but you can sell your business. It, it's it doesn't actually pay very much to be ruthless and short-term thinking. And the example I can give of that is retail food group. Of, of, of taking the wrong approach. This is a company that went in a big multinational, a lot of money, went in and bought up all these brands like Brumbies and the rest. And they said, okay, how can we squeeze the maximum amount of money out of these guys? And they, they screwed the franchisees over. They made them pay twice as much to buy stuff as they could get it from Coles. They made themselves pizzas at a loss. They did all kinds of revolting, immoral things. And okay, in the short term, they made money. In the, in the long term, they just completely wrecked all those companies, all those great brands. They were destroyed and all those lives were destroyed. To me, that's just evil. But it's also bad business. And great long-term companies like Hewlett Packard, um, which I love reading about such companies, they, they, they always think long-term. I love that, long-term thinking. 
Look after your people, look after your customers, but even most, look after your own people. And exactly what Jack Welch doesn't do. He doesn't give us stuff. To him, employees are a cost. They're not an asset. To me, my people, my, my staff, my franchisees, that's, that's my family. That's my tribe. They're the people I've got loyalty to, which is why I got really, really upset when Daniel Andrews shut down my people for eight weeks um, a couple of years back and got really angry about it. Because there was no reason for that. And he never did have a reason. It was all political. You know, what's in the veterans of my political career? And so he, he just really damaged so many families, so many lives. And I, and I, was, I wasn't insulated. I wasn't sitting in a, in a nice room in Spring Street. I was hearing the pain of these people who were denied their, their livelihood, who were shut up at home for no reason at all. Because that's my people. And, and I love that. I, uh, I know you went out to bat for that. I, I know you uh, told the press your feelings and thoughts on that as well. And I think that's probably why we go full, full circle to the beginning of this conversation, whereby you have someone standing up in the middle of a, you know, an event explaining why they love working with you. So I get that real sense. You say every customer is a fan and, you know, uh, and it's really about serving the people around you. I think that's, that's really beautiful. Hey, Jim, the, the core question on this podcast, and I think you may have heard the answer to it already, is, is around the quality of the questions that we ask ourselves. And you know, we say the quality of the question we ask ourselves impact the quality of our life. And with that being true, what's one question that's really had the biggest impact on your life? Is it the question you've given me already? How, how can I do it better? Or was there another one? That is the one question I ask myself yeah. every day. There is not one day of my life, and I include Christmas Day, Easter. I, actually, I find it very difficult not to work. I find the hardest time of the year between Christmas and New Year because there's no business going. I'm very attached to my business. But every day, every day, I'm always answering myself that question. That's why I like franchisees to call me, it actually, or email me. And they do often. I, I, and I ring them, too, like on anniversary and stuff like that. I'm always talking to my staff, always the same question. What's happening? What's going wrong? How can we improve? How can we do it better? You'd actually be very surprised how much of the stuff we do in gyms, the changes that we're made, but not from me. They were from franchisees. Like, just as an example, we had a franchisee who was unhappy with their franchise or being unpleasant. They just were a bit brutal, a bit authoritarian, just shutting down this is a particular franchise or in the mowing division. And I was talking to this guy about it and I was thinking, okay, what can we do better? And I thought, well, there's one thing we really should do out of this. We should give franchisees the right to vote out their franchisors. So we actually got that change for the particular guy and eventually he was voted out and we changed it in the contract. So that's an example of something that's been very powerful because we're the only franchise system in the world that you can vote out your franchisor. And by the way, that includes me because I'm a franchisor directly for about 700 franchisees. And I've said to my franchisees, if you don't like the way that I'm running your region, you can vote me out or you can vote me out of the divisional roles that I have. Now, it's unlikely it would happen because if they weren't happy, I would very quickly ask them, who do you want to be your manager? And I'll find them someone better to look after them. But okay. that's, that came out of a conversation. Somebody just yeah. picked up the phone and rang me. I love that. And because you're always looking, how can I do it better? Then you find a way and you implement it. And uh, I, I can't imagine always implementing things like that are always easy, but because you're always looking to implement and get feedback, then you're going to find your way and find the best outcome. Uh, Jim, there's, there's so much uh, gold that you shared in this episode already. I'd love to ask you um, a little bit about your bucket list. Like, is there still something that you're looking to accomplish or really want to accomplish uh, either now uh, with your business or for yourself uh, in the future? Um. Basically, yes, very much so. I said to you that 7% of our franchisees are reporting poor income. That, that figure should be zero. Our complaints have gone down dramatically over the years. They dropped to a fraction of what they used to be, and they're still dropping. When we get our new software system and done, it'll take us another 18 months probably to do it. I can see them dropping by at least 50%. But my aim is to have no complaints, no unhappy clients ever for any reason. How can we achieve that? Obviously, my research program, I want that to be successful. I want that to be help, be able to help, you know, tens of millions of people worldwide who struggle with, with issues of addiction and so forth and, 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 and poverty and, and, and disadvantage. I mean, these are all, these are all my goals, but they're not, they're, not, they're not a bucket list. I don't want to, to climb Mount Everest. It's, I just want to yep. do what we do better and better and better. And, and it'll never be good enough. There'll never be a time, I can guarantee you, when I sit back and say, 
Kevin, this is good enough. We've achieved it. No, we can't achieve that because we can never, ever be absolutely perfect. As long as one franchisee is not totally happy with what we're providing for them, then I have failed. Wow. That's a, and very strong words there. And I feel your passion and your determination as, as you say that. One franchisee unhappy, one customer unhappy, then it's a failure. And of course, you're very driven to make sure that doesn't happen, Jim. I, I really feel that in your energy. That's not just meaningless words. You, you believe that through to your core. There's such conviction there. Uh, Jim, if anyone listening wanted to get connected with you or the organization, where's the best place for them to find you? Um, just got website, www.gyms.net. If you, if you're interested in like a franchise or something like that, then you go through there or you want to book a job and so forth. If you have some other thing that you want to talk about, like you want to say, start up a new division, for example, then I'd love to talk to you direct. Just email me, Jim at gyms.net. So I'm, I'm, I'm very easy to, to reach as you found out. I, I, I uh, found out it's true. <laughs> I do have that issue where I, I, I clean my inbox, email box regularly and people who want to email me can get onto me. Now, most people are just trying to sell me something and I just, that doesn't take very long to say no, but those who need to get through can actually reach me very quickly. Yes. Hey, and Jim, just talk less briefly about your additional divisions, because I know you have, uh, sorry, I can't even remember, like 40 plus divisions there or, or significantly more than that? Yes, that's better. Not, about, about 40 it, divisions. Not. Yeah. And so then you said if anyone wants to propose one to you, so basically they bring their idea, their concepts, and, and with your knowledge and experience of franchising, then you can help yeah. uh, help make the magic happen. That's right. I mean, just to, just just a few months back, um, so, uh, a guy called Jason Jett, who actually used to be one of my early franchisees, he went away and did a big business in Scratch and Den. So he's, he's a great guy. He's a franchisor with us. He's got this experience. He came back and said, I'd like to do gym scratch and ditch. And I said, fantastic. That's great. It's now running. He's got about four franchises. He's been going about two months. And he's, 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 he's gone like a rocket. Last year, in, in March last year, we launched Jim's Laundry. One of our franchisors did. Laundry services now got, I think, 40 franchisees. It's, it's, wow. it's running up. The thing of it is, the opportunities are amazing. To, to me, the whole world is full of, it's like there's, there's gold lying around in the ground. You just got to go and pick it up. And, and just, it's so, it's not difficult to do these things if you're the right kind of person. It's not education. It's not money. It's not brains. It's character. And if you have a great character and you listen to what we tell you and take our advice, and then you start developing your own ideas, Look, I've been in business for a long time, like half a century and so forth, but I'm still learning so much from some people. Like, like we have a guy, like Dan, a guy I was telling you about, the one from um, McDonald's. I mean, one of the most amazing things is this guy developed a business which was built up a very successful, very profitable business, but his actual survey rating is 5.0. That means to say virtually every customer even though he wasn't supervising them directly, he had a system in place that every customer got great service and he made sure they did. And there's another one, a guy called Jared Curtis. We're about to run a seminar later this month to teach our franchisees how to do it. He's got like 12 people working for him. He's got a 5.0 rating, which is great. The average gym's rating is about 4.67, which, which means generally they're good, but they have some bad ones because the bad rating is one star. But these guys are 5.0, and yet they've got major profitable businesses. How do they do it? I've learned so much from these guys. And this is just in the past six months. It's amazing. And actually, for anyone listening with a business, do you get your uh, customers to rate you? And if not, like, why not? Because this would drive uh, back to this, how can I do it better? It really drives that. And I know, uh, Jim, you, you personally deal with every complaint that comes through as well. So nothing's going to yeah. get past you. So you learn whatever the problems are, the challenges are. You either deal well, with I, it I, or I, uh, put it into the system. Yeah. I read the complaints because I go through them, but I don't deal with them directly. The franchisors deal with them. If the franchisors doesn't, don't deal with them, and it comes back to me, then I got on top. And that's usually pretty drastic. It's like, you do something about this, or I'm going to refund the client and bill you for it. It's, <laughs> it's a fairly tough-nosed response. So they usually, it's better for them to try and cope with the problem themselves. But the ideal response to a complaint, actually, I, I, I will delete a complaint if you can prove that you did the right thing. In other words, a client says you never rang, okay. Here's a call within two hours. Here's a text when you couldn't get through. So you tried. Or more likely still, 
the client wasn't happy in some way, but you went back and you fixed it and the client's now happy. And then I'll wipe the complaint, wipe the bad survey. So it's a fairly drastic system and it puts a lot of pressure. And people often complain I'm, I'm, I'm causing them mental illness. <laughs> it's kind of ironic <laughs> because I'm a big passion for mental health, but still it, it's, it's, it puts a lot of pressure on people to do the right thing, but it's so effective. And that's why we get such a great um, success rate with our franchisees why the great majority do so well, because on the whole, we have lots and lots of work and most of them give very, very good customer service. I mean, maybe because they're scared of me, I don't know, but they, but they do, <laughs> it works. It's a great business model. And you know, the interesting thing about that is that even though we've got like 38% unserviced leads so far this year, which is growing year by year, um, we actually tell our franchisees, quote, high, don't be cheap, charge more than the other guy, charge more than the competition never ever ever compete on price give great service so even though we still charge more we aim to charge more than the marketplace in general we still have a massive oversupply of work and that just shows you there's a demand for quality there you go and there's a need then clearly for more franchisees and more people to come and help service all of those uh, those leads and we even could do with charge- ten thousand franchisees kevin we would not lack work i can tell you yeah, wow. And that's uh, amazing to have such confidence around that. And so if you're looking for a new opportunity, then no, uh, then you should. Now, Jim, uh, I mentioned that I know you from Australia, but I believe you're in New Zealand and Canada as well. That's right. Yeah. Uh, New Zealand, um, we've got about 300 over there. Never quite as successful. Canada, we've got about 60. It's, it's very difficult to export the Jim's model because so much of it's about culture. We Ooh. find that people who come to training, I give courses of training. The first talk I give at training on the Monday morning is called the ethos talk. And it's really very intense about service to customers, service to franchisees. And then I get to meet people. I, I try and actually meet every single person who does training. There's usually about a hundred there. And, you know, just, just say something to them, let them know that I'm there. I'm interested in them and they can contact me anytime. And please do. I, I, again, again, I say, when I, when I email you about something, respond to me, tell me what's happening. Tell me how you're going. I send them an email after one month to ask how they're going. So that, that culture, that, that emotional driver for service, service to customers, service to franchisees, the trouble is when it goes overseas, it tends to get watered down a bit. Like we went to the UK and quite frankly, it was a failure. We did okay when they used to come to Australia for training. As soon as we said local training, it started to die. And the culture died because they they soften the edges they they you know let's just let's, let's not worry i know when we first started bringing in the um complaint system to new zealand the, the new zealand franchise all said yeah it's okay we don't need it here because our customer service is so good unlike you in australia i mean you need that sort of stuff but we don't <laughs> we're so brilliant and the interesting thing when we started to study the whole thing we actually did measurements properly we found they were actually a lot worse than us which is one reason they weren't going so well. So you've always got to be pushing and pushing and pushing. And it makes people uncomfortable. I push my franchisees to give great service. And they, and they say, you're stressing me. You're causing me anxiety. Well, yes, but it's good for you and good for the company. And my franchise also get annoyed at me too, because I'm always saying, you've got to ring your franchisees regularly. And you've got to keep notes. And you've got to fill up complaints. And you've got to do these things. And they don't always want to. Sometimes they'll get very annoyed at me. So there's always this pressure. Just, Jim, lighten up, you know. Just take it easy. And everything's going to be happy and we'll, you'll have fantastic growth, profitable. You just have to stop being so anal and so fanatical about these things. But that's what makes it work. It's, it's yeah. the passion that drives it. Always driving yeah. for better service, never giving up. And I never, ever intend to give up. I'm 70 years old. My life expectancy is probably another quarter century or so. And I intend to be, I'm pushing till the end. And when I retire, I'll be in a box on the floor in my funeral. That'll be it. That's it, done. And I get that sense, never give up, keep going. And especially in regards to uh, making every customer a fan, finding how you can do every single thing better. And in, in what you just said there, you need a measurement system in place as well. And if that's measuring the five-star ratings and the one-star ratings, you know, whatever it is to measure that and make sure you're progressing in the right direction. Uh, Jim, you've been an absolute uh, star today. I really appreciate absolutely everything that you've had to share with us. Uh, if there's anything else that you wanted to, uh, to share with the audience before we go today. No, no. What, what you no. see is great. No. To the asset of it. Um, it's, yeah. it's not. It's not a difficult thing, is it? Really, Kevin. It's just. It's just having a passion and really striving for excellence and understanding that character is above everything. 
character above everything else. So start with character. Simon Sinek got it wrong. Let's change that to Jim Penman. We don't start with why, we start with character. Jim, you have a lot of character. You've done uh, a really amazing job on the episode today, and I, I can't thank you enough for your time. Oh, thanks, Kevin. Good to be here.